They had been told that they would soon be taken to paradise. Chosen by the great masters of the universe, these disciples were ready to fly off to a distant planet. What their leaders had forgotten to tell them was that this cosmic trip was going to cost them their lives. These unfortunate gullible souls were unable to tell the difference between cosmic visionaries and imposters. October 1994, the horrific incidents involving the Order of the Solar Temple, which took place in both Switzerland and Quebec, put the spotlight on the hidden world of cults, which were created during what is now referred to as the Contactee Movement. In 1952, an American immigrant of Polish descent gave a whole new meaning to UFO sightings. Before a room full of press agents eager for a sensational story, George Adamski said that he had telepathically received a message telling him to go to the Mojave Desert where he saw a spaceship. Adamski claimed that he was in contact with the pilot of the craft who said he came from Venus and was here to warn humans of the dangers of nuclear weapons. Adamski's story was hailed by UFO groups as proof that UFOs were of extraterrestrial origin. The following year, Adamski co-authored Flying Saucers Have Landed, which became a huge success and marked the beginning of the contactee movement. In the months following the publication of this book, several individuals claimed that they had also been contacted by extraterrestrials from Venus or Mars. Well before that, at the turn of the century, researchers at the Lowell Observatory had noted features on Mars that seemed to indicate the possibility of seasonal patterns. And according to Schiaparelli and Percival Lowell, these features might be channels made by intelligent beings. In the 1950s, astronomers were already aware of the properties of the planets in our solar system, like Mars and Venus. It was known that Mars had a very thin atmosphere. Venus's atmosphere was very thick and hot. Still, researchers had a fairly good idea of the patterns on those planets. If we look back, there was that famous radio program by Orson Welles that shocked the world in the 1930s, just when World War II was starting. Radio listeners thought that Earth was being invaded by Martians. I think that society's fascination with the possibility of alien visits was stoked by events such as that. Astrophysicists and photography experts proved scientifically that Adamski's claims had to be false. From then on, UFO groups distanced themselves from the contactee movement. Ignored by the UFO community and often ridiculed by the media, the contactee movement developed on the fringes. Nowadays, there are hundreds of these semi-religious groups who believe that we are in contact with extraterrestrials. Head of religious studies at Laval University in Quebec City, Alain Bouchard takes a keen interest in these new religious beliefs. 
If we look at the number of groups generated by the contactee movement, we're talking about several hundred. But they're mostly small groups with just a few members each. We would need field researchers to find them all. In most cases, the group only lasts as long as its founder is alive, or until the novelty of a revelation dies down. One of the first mysticism-based UFO groups to crop up in the United States was the Unarius Academy of Science. Unarius stands for Universal Articulate Interdimensional Understanding of Science. My name is Dr. Charles Spiegel. I'm the present director of the Unarius Academy of Science. Unarius is a nonprofit, tax-exempt, educational, and scientific foundation. 33 spaceships that will land, will land right here on this land. In fact, I can point right up here where this sign is. It says, Welcome Space Brothers. Despite the fact that its two founders had left their mortal remains on Earth and extraterrestrials had failed to show up at the appointed contact times, Unarius continues to flourish with more than 6,000 members. Ruth and Ernest Norman founded Unarius in 1954 claiming that aliens had asked them to free humanity of its karma. Since, according to Unarius philosophy, current humanity is nothing more than the product of a series of reincarnations. Ruth Norman claimed that she was the reincarnation of Socrates, Mary Magdalene, and Mona Lisa. The future of the Earth world is positive, progressive, we promise you. While it's true that most groups created by the contactee movement were trendy and harmless, the horrors of the Solar Temple led to increased vigilance by state and civil authorities. Mathieu Corsu maintains a French internet site designed to protect people from the dangers of cults. People like to talk about UFOs and extraterrestrials. There's a certain mystery to them. In the U.S., a lot of subjects were raised by contactee groups. For example, a while back, there was a guru who used to talk about universal energy, a master Dang, that was his name. He supposedly received instructions from higher beings who came to see him while he was traveling on an airplane. There was also Izozen, a sect whose guru received messages. To attract new members into their flocks, they needed a gimmick, one that would seduce people in different ways. For instance, a sect might attract new members by claiming to have the answers to questions that we all wonder about. Who are we? Where are we headed? What will become of us? Claiming that extraterrestrials are coming makes the group more mysterious and attracts people to that group. The more mysterious the discussions, the better. And when discussions focus on extraterrestrials, the members of the group feel privileged. I'm part of something special, and extraterrestrials are communicating with me. Extraterrestrials appear to have the same qualities as God. They know everything and can do almost anything. Technologically speaking, they're 25,000 years ahead of us, according to the Raelians. So an extraterrestrial is like a god. From one group to the next, these New Age religions seem to have the same basic format. If they're not expressly alien in origin, then the founders are prophets chosen to pass on a message from a cosmic visionary. You've always dreamed of studying under Jesus, Buddha or Muhammad? Well, it's too late for them, but it's not too late to study with me. In general, the message always goes along the same line. There are both good and bad extraterrestrials. The evil ones want to destroy humanity while the good ones want to save it. The disciples in the cult are the elected ones, 
who are under the protection of the good extraterrestrials. There is no typical profile, but we've noticed that each group has a family atmosphere, if you will. How can we typify people who join these cults? Choosing a religious minority sets them apart from the rest of society. They generally have a lot of drive, so it's odd that they're usually portrayed as sheep. Research has shown that these people want to distinguish themselves from others. Joining a cult is an act of defiance, since the person will be noticed and perhaps ridiculed. So, one of the main characteristics of these people is that they wish to stand out in a religious sense. There are also people who question life. I would say that best describes the people who join these groups. They identify themselves with their group. Probably the main thing that they have in common is a desire to distinguish themselves from others. I don't think that anyone here on Earth is 100% safe from the powerful influence of a sect. The 1970s and the New Age movement breathed new life into these UFO-based cults. Several leaders stole ideas from Eric Von Daniken and Robert Charoux, who had come up with the theory of ancient astronauts. Contactees' visions changed with the times. Pilot uniforms were replaced by long white robes, and extraterrestrials, who had previously appeared in the flesh, now appeared as ethereal beings living on higher spiritual planes. Cosmic messengers no longer needed their spaceships. They could now communicate with humans telepathically. In the midst of this shift in perception, a young man from France, Claude Varillon, publicly announced that he had been contacted by extraterrestrials on December 13, 1973. It seems that Claude Vaurion, who had previously gone by the name of Claude Seller when he was a pop singer, was now being encouraged by his cosmic visionaries to change his name to Rael, signifying light bearer. First, he tried his hand at a singing career, imitating Jacques Brel. Raelians sing of honey and cinnamon, but that song was originally called Sacré Sale Gueule, and when he sang it, he looked like Brel's clone. After that, he tried his luck as a sports reporter, since he loved automobile racing. He started a small magazine called Autopop. But when the energy crisis hit in the 1970s, his magazine went down, since auto racing had stopped due to energy restrictions. Then he appeared on a French television program called Le Grand Échiquier. He explained that one day, while walking in the Auvergne Volcano Park, he met up with some beings who said that they were Alhems. They were about four feet tall and had contacted him to pass on a message. In 1973, I was a reporter for an auto racing magazine in France. As I was walking through the Auvergne Volcano Park, I saw a bright spaceship land near me. A small being came out of the craft and gave me a message, which you can read in this book, True Face of God. It's available in all bookstores in Quebec. This message explains that in the beginning, when there was no life on Earth, these extraterrestrials came and created life on Earth. Okay. From then on, people began to contact him after they saw him on television. That's when the movement started. As far as we know, in the beginning, Claude Vaurion was not an authority figure, someone who takes himself too seriously. He was just a guy with a message to deliver, right? Then gradually, as I see it, he began to get off track. The attention went to his head. The approach changed from a laid-back atmosphere where no one was really in charge, there was no authority figure. This was back in the 1970s when there was a sexual liberation movement happening and everyone was talking peace and love, to an approach that's entirely different today. 
If you compare the Claude Vorillon that people knew back in the 1970s with the beloved prophet, as he is known today, dressed in his cosmonaut outfit that smells like mothballs, it's amazing to see how he has changed. I think that as he went along, Claude Vorillon became a typical example of someone who was guru-fied. He became richer and richher. How much do we know about the truth of his original story? We do know that it contains a lot of contradictions. For example, we checked the weather conditions on the day that he supposedly met these beings, and it doesn't match what he said. There was a program on the M6 network in which a childhood friend of Claude Vaurillon's was interviewed. And this friend said that during the course of a meal together, Vorillon had told him something like, in any event, I made up the whole thing. You already knew that. It's not news to you. According to Roland Chevalier, Vorillon came up with this tale, people believed him, and he was suddenly in the limelight with more social status than ever before. If you look at the description of Claude Vorillon given by Jacques Chancel, he was an ordinary middle-class guy who wore glasses. Then if you look at Claude Vorillon in the 1970s, he appears more lively and liberated. Everything Claude Vorillon says, his main theme is based on the theory of ancient astronauts. If you look at the cover of the first books published by Rael, you can't help but notice how they resemble books published by Robert Laffont, with a black background and yellow print. If you read Claude Vorillon's books, you soon realize that they're full of plagiarisms. And his story about the Elohims? That's a plural Hebrew word, which for some people means extraterrestrials. That explanation comes from an author named Jean Sandy, who wrote a book called The Moon Outpost of the Gods. What's interesting is that if you bring up these facts to the Raelians, they will simply tell you that other people had insights before he did, and that doesn't make him any less important. But as you dig deeper, you find plagiarism upon plagiarism. The shape of the flying saucer, for instance, obviously came directly from Adamski. The only the difference was that Adamski described it and Claude Vaurion drew it. The similarities go on and on. He even used the symbol of the Star of David with a swastika in the center, which he stole from Adamski as well. It was mentioned in Adamski's book Inside Spaceships. Everything that Claude Vaurion says has already been said by someone else before him. He simply puts a different spin on it and simplifies it. When you are familiar with other authors, it's more like bad science fiction than anything else. It's plagiarism pure and simple. And when I say he copied other people, I mean dates too. Not only did he steal the image of the flying saucer from Adamski, he also stole the date that the incident happened, December 13th. Unlike France, where a climate of intolerance close to that of a witch hunt has been felt since the Solar Temple tragedy, we must resist the temptation to compare all cults or religious minority groups to extremists like the Solar Temple or Heaven's Gate. In actuality, very few of these groups are a real danger to their followers. The Raelian movement founded by Claude Vaurillon may seem troubling since it is on the fringes of society, but it is still nothing more than a cult. People seem to have started thinking that the Raelian movement is another religion, a sect that believes in God. No. I recall that my original messages were misconstrued by the tabloids. We're anything but a sect. We don't believe in God. We believe in extraterrestrials who are beings like you and I, but much more technologically advanced than we are, creating a sort of cultural shock at the technological level. It's a bit like the movie The Gods Must Be crazy, where an empty Coke bottle lands on the ground and the Bushman thinks to himself, the gods must have sent this. There are no gods, and there's no such thing as a soul. That being said, how can we possibly be qualified as a sect? I don't understand. I wish to repeat that our religion, as you call it, is not religion at all. It's science. The secularization of religion has led to a drop in spirituality within society. It's as if science was taking the place of religion. Religion is becoming more secularized, while science is becoming more spiritual. Science leads to technological advances. That was one of the traits of the 1950s, a movement towards idealizing technology 
technology. Even today we're fixated with technology. Just look at computers. If I want to be socially accepted, I need a laptop computer and a cell phone. It's almost as if we identify ourselves with our technology. We live in a society where technology is all around us. The same thing happened to religion as well. What we need to understand is that thanks to technology and science, the world we live in in 20 years from now won't look anything like it does now. I'm telling you, it'll be totally different. People think that evolution is progressing at a constant rate, and it will take us centuries to advance. That's just not true. Why? Because of computers. That's what I explain in this book. Computers become almost twice as powerful each year. To sum it up, we've discovered more things in the past 20 years than we have in the entire history of the human race. In the next 10 years, we'll do the same thing. Then in five years, then in two years, then in less than a year, then in six months, then in three months. If we add up all those time frames, we arrive at 2020, 2025. By the time we get to that period, we'll be discovering more within one week than we did in the history of the human race. Then, in a day. Eventually, we will get to the point where transhumans, as I like to call them, will be able to discover major principles within the space of a minute. By 2020, 2025, we'll know everything. Extraterrestrials are the gods who created us, just like the Bible says that God created us. We have taken the biblical model and changed the word God to extraterrestrials. And we have replaced all of the acts of God with technological know-how, laser beams, clones produced in the lab, and so forth. Cloning is a tool mentioned in the message from the Elohims. At first, our followers were a bit hesitant to talk about the connection between the Bible and extraterrestrials, but when it comes to science, young people get very excited. There's a big difference between the old academic scientists who are against anything new which is normal since they're old and tired, uh, the, the dinosaurs of science, and today's youth, who flock to us by the thousands, full of enthusiasm. We stated our mission from the outset 27 years ago. We're in favor of technological advances. That's why I wrote this book, Yes to Human Cloning. We're not just in favor of cloning, we're also in favor of genetic engineering. We're in favor of genetically altering plants. If you give me a choice between two boxes of strawberries, one of which is grown normally and the other genetically altered, I would immediately pick the box that was genetically altered. They contain far less pesticides, and even though they have modified genes, the digestive system can still break them down. They pose no threat to the human body. So-called normal plants are huge polluters. They are the reason why pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides are sprayed into nature. With genetically altered products, we are actually protecting the environment. Condemning anything that is new and modern is considered to be politically correct, but it's a false promotion of green products. We support anything that is new, without exception. Play games that are worth playing. Go ahead and play. Change your sources of pleasure. Find something new to excite you. Come and play in the game of life where we can play together. 20 years from now, there'll be thousands of cloned children in perfect health. Just watch. 20 years from now, even if I'm not around anymore, you'll meet with my successors. And everyone will say, I can't believe how they criticized Riel back then. Once the news was out that they had cloned Dolly the sheep, Riel was quick to announce that he was setting up the first company to clone humans. A few years later, I don't know whether or not you read his book, Yes to Human Cloning, but in it he explains that he made that statement for the publicity. Basically, in the beginning, Clonade was just a publicity stunt. I call that an empty shell. All those years that it was nothing more than an empty shell, he would tell people that they were doing something. They were going to clone a human. It would be soon, within a year. Then he announced that he was building a lab and they were working on the clone. The owner of the lab, Mark Hunt, who wished to remain anonymous since he was an American lawyer and politician, wanted to clone his child, who had died at an early age. He had asked the Raelians to do one thing, 
to verify whether his child's DNA could be used to create a clone. They couldn't even do that much, he said in the Charleston Gazette. It cost them the equivalent of $250,000. We're now asking parents to pay $200,000 to have their child cloned. After all, we're not talking about the price of a condom here. As I told you earlier, Roland Chevalier publicly admitted that Rael had confessed to inventing everything. His daughter discovered the same thing. She got upset at her father, and as a result, she was excluded from the Raelian movement, excommunicated, as it were, and her cellular plan was cancelled. Your cellular plan is what allows you to be cloned on the Elohim's planet. The Raelians don't believe that we have a soul. Without a cellular plan, you can't come back to life. You're dead forever. So here, his own daughter was excluded from the Raelian movement and her cellular plan was cancelled. Why? What I heard from ex-members is that she went around saying that her father was making up lies. Her name is Aurore Vorillon. Other than the family problems caused by his speeches, Royel has been free to spread his teachings throughout Quebec. Perceived as amusing by the majority of the population, Royalian theories are for the most part harmless, according to experts. If we look at these groups as a whole, we see that their emergence reflects changes in our society, especially in the area of religion. The Raelian movement reflects changes that have taken place in Europe and North America, especially with regards to the Catholic Church. I think that these new religions, and the Raelian movement in particular, are symptomatic of these changes in our society. What are the main characteristics of our society? Freedom and democracy. I think that the creation of these groups is actually a very positive sign. It means that we live in a society where we allow the creation of new concepts, even if they may at times seem bizarre. Taken from this angle, I don't think that we should see a danger in them. They're a sign that democracy is working. What worries me is when a group puts someone up on a pedestal and that person starts losing sight of reality. From their pedestal, the person may start believing that anything is possible. They could say pretty much anything they wanted to and people would believe them. I've read some of his material and I thought to myself, this can't be possible. He goes on and on. It's like a joke. He's just rambling on. He's got to be aware that he's just spouting nonsense. It's as if he's testing his followers, pushing them to their limits. The problem is that they don't seem to have a limit. As time goes on, it just gets worse. What do I see as the danger when someone is that high up, always on a pedestal? They lose their sense of perspective. They can even end up believing all of the nonsense that they originally made up. We saw that happen with the Church of Scientology and its leader, Ron Hubbard, who upon his death had come to believe all of the tales he had told his followers. That's the danger. On October 6, 1994, a story hit the newspapers and television networks. An unexpected and horrific event had just taken place in Morin Heights, Quebec. Police found the remains of two bodies in a burnt house, apparent victims of suicide. A few hours later, it was announced that three more bodies had been found. All of the victims had been members of a sect, the Order of the Solar Temple. And it seemed that some of the victims had not committed suicide. They had been killed in cold blood. While the population of Quebec was still reeling over this tragedy, another news story broke out even wilder that struck horror in the hearts of Europeans. In Chery and Grand Chaux-Servin, police officers had just found the bodies of 48 victims also members of the Order of the Solar Temple, in the smoking remnants of two burnt homes. In total, there were 53 deaths, including several children. 
Journalists and police officers in Quebec and Switzerland sought a reason why the members of this sect would have done such a thing. And they discovered the disturbing teachings of the Solar Temple. The names of the two main leaders were released to the public. Joe Dimambro, the high priest of the temple, and Luc Jouret, a man who used his charisma to attract new members. Francois Bourbeau, the director of UFO Alert Quebec, remembers the first time that he met Luc Jouret. When did I meet Luc Jouret? It was in 1985, during his first visit to Quebec. He gave me a brief interview about 20 minutes long. I saw him again in the fall of 1989, when I introduced him at a three-hour-long conference in Quebec City. That was when I saw the real Luc Jouret. His hair was longer, and he was a bit of a playboy. He looked at the women a lot, and he changed his story somewhat. He didn't talk about extraterrestrials in public. He spoke about them with me later in private. But I learned that there was a dark side to his story. A few of my colleagues who were working on a story for the magazine Alter Ego discovered that Luc Jouret had a project underway with a large investment corporation in Toronto, Clarkson Gordon to be exact, an accounting firm to build a hotel in Shawinigan worth 13 million with a circular runway for flying saucers to land on. An investigation by Quebec police officers revealed that several employees of Hydro-Quebec were gravitating towards the order of the Solar Temple. One of the tabloids soon inferred that the provincial government had been infiltrated by members of the Solar Temple. Inspector Jacques Saint-Pierre was closely involved in the investigation of the matter. He has a somewhat different interpretation. What happened is that Luc Jouret gave several conferences. He had an incredible amount of charisma. Some companies invited him to come and speak to their employees, and one of them was Hydro-Québec. He had such a charismatic aura about him that some people were drawn to what he had to say. Some people believe in religion, while others have lost faith. They no longer have any lifetime dreams or goals. They've achieved everything that they hope to achieve, and now they're looking for something new to latch on to, to feel alive again. That's what happened in some cases. Certain people may have found something interesting in what Luc Jura had to say and decided to join his cause. At first, the order of the Solar Temple based itself on beliefs and rites harking back to the days of Templars and medieval knights creating rituals that involved not only famous symbols such as Excalibur, but also more modern religious items. When asked about the ceremonies that took place within the sanctuary of the temple, some members confided to investigators that they had seen several strange phenomena, such as the appearance of cosmic masters. Some of these visions, or should I say illusions, were likely created using classic techniques practiced by magicians, or perhaps a sophisticated holographic projector. During the investigation, I also learned that Mr. Dutois, one of the victims in Moran Heights, had been a self-educated man. He would have been capable of producing a machine to project holograms. The reason why Mr. Dutois died is because he knew everything that was going on. He couldn't stick around here on Earth. He had to be killed. In addition to the medieval ritual symbolizing knighthood, the order of the Solar Temple gradually began to integrate an extraterrestrial element. When the time came, Temple members would have the exclusive privilege of being transported across the galaxy to the planet Sirius, where a better life awaited them.
Le fait que des gens attendent... The fact that they were expecting the world to come to an end did not make them dangerous. Christianity has existed for 2,000 years and is based on that belief. We have no criteria for determining how dangerous a group is becoming. As is often the case, right up until a week before the tragic events, we had no idea that anything was going wrong. All we know is that it builds slowly, like internal combustion, and it only takes a minor shift within for panic to strike, and then boom. Joe de Mambro's days were numbered. When we investigated, we discovered that he had been very sick. He was not expected to live long. Since he didn't have anyone to replace him, to take charge of the solar temple once he was gone, the days of the order itself were numbered as well. That was probably what drove Joe de Mambro to decide that the time had come for the trip to Sirius. There was no one to carry on the temple. Even if we can try to understand what was going through Joe de Mambro's mind when he announced that it was time for the trip to Sirius, it's even harder for us to understand why he wasn't content to just take volunteers with him, why he chose to murder certain members of the Solar Temple. Several members were murdered, and I can explain why. In the teachings of the Solar Temple, there was one element that was fundamental. Eventually, they would be transported to Sirius. But members of the Order of the Solar Temple would not have committed suicide. Suicide was forbidden within the Temple. The only way to be transported to Sirius was by fire. Among the victims, there were people who actually believed the teachings. But as you know, there's a big difference between believing something and acting on it. So some members believed in the teachings, believed that they would someday find themselves on their way to Sirius, but not necessarily when Joe de Mambro decided they would. Numerology was important to them and played a key role in their teachings. So they needed a precise number of victims. Since the number of members willing to make the trip with Joe de Mambro was lower than the predetermined number, they decided that they needed to kill enough members to make up the difference. If you were to ask me what the leaders of the Solar Temple said to their members, what they hoped to gain, I think the answer is quite simple. They wanted the same thing as every guru in charge of every sect, money and power. Barely four years after the Solar Temple horror, another cosmic visionary made the headlines. This time in California, Marshall Herf Applewhite. In 1972, after receiving a series of treatments at a psychiatric hospital in Houston, Applewhite and one of his nurses, Bonnie Lou Nettles, began a spiritual odyssey based on their alleged contact with extraterrestrials. Dubbed the two, Applewhite and Nettles used the Bible to attract followers to their flock, specifically the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verse 3. I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Naturally, the two witnesses spoken of in the Holy Scriptures were none other than our two cosmic gurus, Applewhite and Nettles, who began to go by the names Bo and Peep. Through telepathic contact with friendly extraterrestrials, the gurus learned that evil extraterrestrials were preparing to destroy the human race. Their cosmic visionaries instructed them to identify a group of chosen ones to be removed from Earth and placed in safety. In the spring of 1997, UFO researchers noticed a strange light at the tail end of comet hale bopp Marshall Applewhite, who had changed the name of the group to Heaven's Gate when Nettles died in 1985, said that he was certain this light was the famous spaceship 
coming to take the disciples away, despite formal contradictions by professional astronomers. Heaven's Gate was a much more self-contained group. If there was any interaction with the outside world, it would have been through the Internet, since several members had websites. But overall, they operated as a small group and kept to themselves, which led to the incidents that took place in California. After having videotaped farewell messages to their friends and family, the 21 women and 18 men in Heaven's Gate took a deadly drink containing alcohol laced with a drug. There's just no way of describing the great experience how much we're looking forward to what's ahead for us now. Do I think that the Raelians are a UFO-based movement like, say, Heaven's Gate was a UFO-based movement that ended in the tragedy that we all know, the collective suicide of 35 people? My first reaction is to say, no, I don't think so. But I would like to add that there are things going on within the Raelian movement that aren't exactly kosher. We are in favor of eugenics. Geniocracy means rule by geniuses. It's an elitist view. And added to this elitism is the idea of genetic purity, which must be absolute. If you are genetically impure, the Elohims, the creators, don't want you around. Tiny robots so small that you could fit billions of them into a drop of water. Just imagine if Rael were to have a successor that took all of this stuff seriously. The tragedies that took place within the Order of the Solar Temple and Heaven's Gate make us wonder if perhaps legislators and the police should take more drastic measures to prevent any further carnage. Can we predict when things will get out of control within a sect to the point of suicide? That's a difficult question to answer. If it were predictable, then the police would be able to step in and prevent it from happening. I live in a democratic society, and as I always say, as long as I respect the freedom of others, I guarantee my own freedom. When we talk about groups that are similar to the order of the Solar Temple, we need to get one thing straight. The Quebec Provincial Police carry out an investigation whenever a crime is committed. But if no crime is committed, the police have no reason to investigate. They don't go around investigating things just for the fun of it. A crime must have been committed. Obviously, there are other groups that resemble the Solar Temple. But until a crime is committed, the Quebec Police Force does not get involved. Personally, I prefer to live in a tolerant society rather than one which believes in witch hunts like France. It's unfortunate that people think there is a witch hunt going on in our society. As a volunteer of an association, my own personal goal is not to pursue a witch hunt. It's more a matter of prevention and precaution. I feel that people are wrong in thinking that we are conducting a witch hunt. French legislators have no wish to instate a witch hunt of any kind. France is a democratic country, a secular state. It's important to separate spiritual matters from worldly matters. Separating spiritual matters from worldly matters. For individuals questioning their existence, isn't it more satisfying to the ego to know that you are a member of a chosen few? Isn't it somehow gratifying to rub elbows with visionaries who are the reincarnation of Socrates, Mona Lisa, or even Jesus himself? And when these cosmic gurus invite us to join them on an intergalactic journey to a far-off paradise, how can we turn down such an inviting offer? How can we tell the difference between spiritual matters and worldly matters? How can we unmask the imposter disguised as a cosmic visionary? Now that we are in the 21st century, contacts with extraterrestrials are far from subsiding. They are being used more and more often by gurus. 
This brings to mind a quote by Viktor Stokowski, who wrote a major paper on visitors from other worlds called Men, Gods, and Extraterrestrials. We may not like the world as it is. We may find reality to be confusing, boring, and at times cruel. But it is dangerous to dwell in the absolute certainty that beyond this reality lies a mystical paradise, a better life that we can achieve by sacrificing our life in the here and now. If a group is led by someone who is so terrific, so personable, so humane that you find yourself thinking, why haven't I heard of this person before? And when the goal of the group is so fantastic that you find yourself thinking, this is too good to be true, well, then it probably is too good to be true. Always use discernment.